Good day, friends. It's nice to be back in this saddle a couple weeks off, and now we're back online with a message today. I want to talk to you about hope. You know, hope is a, a really hard sell lately. Worsening political divisions, catastrophic social, economic, and educational disruptions caused by the lockdown, inflation at a 40-year high, food and formula shortages, surging crime in our cities, and a fentanyl crisis aided by a functionally open southern border have combined to make this the worst period of our lives. We live in serious times, yet we aren't being led by serious people. The ruling political class focuses on insignificant issues, ignores multiple crises, and then doubles down on the very policies that have created the whole mess in the first place. Humanly speaking, there is no hope for America. At least, not as the word is typically used. In the world, hope is nothing more than a feeling or a desire for certain things to happen. The problem is feelings don't fill gas tanks, put food on the table, restore safety to our streets, or stem the flow of illegal drugs. We need something a lot more than I hope so, friends. Now, the Bible <clears throat> offers a better definition because it comes from a better source. The New Testament word for hope speaks of a confident expectation, where confident is the optimal word. So, where the world crosses its fingers and says, I hope so, those who belong to Christ read the scriptures and they can say, I know so. This is what the Apostle Paul displays in his second letter to Timothy. Listen to this, one of my favorite verses. I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. If you know anything about Paul's life, you know that it wasn't easy at all. And he was able to say, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded, I am confident, <clears throat> convinced that he is able to keep what I've given to him against the day. Today's text is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1-5, through 5, and it helps us get to the place where Paul was in our own lives. I hope you'll stay with me as we spend this time in God's Word together. But first, let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for the privilege of being back together, Father, in this format. Thank you, Lord, for your Word, which is forever established in heaven. Thank you that we can spend time, and we must spend time every day, reading it and studying it and memorizing it and treasuring it in our hearts. I pray you'd help us to do all those things today, and that the result would be what it always is, in my experience, um, understanding and peace and blessing and calm. Oh, we need those things today, Father. So we ask them all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we begin, we need to uh, to know that Peter is writing to a people who are suffering persecution for their faith. Now, although the harassment is mostly verbal at this point, it's still vicious and it still hurts. Slanderous accusations are being made against the saints, which is undermining their relationships, causing damage to their standing in the community, and depriving them of their livelihood. Marginalized, maligned, misunderstood, Sounds like how Christians are increasingly being treated in our country. That makes these hard times to be living through, friend. So I want to share with you what the Apostle shared with his audience in this important biblical passage, two truths to strengthen our hope in hard times. And they, here they are. There are selection and our protection. Let's look at these in more detail. First of all, we see from the text that we have been selected to be God's child. I see this in verses 1 and 2. Selected to be God's child. Now let that sink in for a moment. If you're a Christian, it's because the God of the universe chose you to be his child. He set his love on you for no other reason than his own sovereign will. And he did that before the foundation of the world. And then he made a covenant, a binding agreement with you that provides the foundation of this new relationship. He did the same thing with ancient Israel, and he promised it to the, in the Old Testament prophet of Jeremiah another covenant, a new covenant to come, that would also then extend to the New Testament people of God, the Church of Jesus Christ. Here's what he said. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's Jeremiah 31, 33. 
So this would be an internal spiritual covenant, demonstrated not by the right of outward circumcision, but by the circumcision of a believer's heart. Interestingly, the Lord Jesus instituted or initiated this new covenant in the upper room during Passion Week. And we celebrate it every time we share the Lord's Supper in communion. Remember, the words that we use, very familiar, you're going to recognize them. If you go to church regularly, you hear these words on Communion Sunday from the book of Corinthians. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in his greeting, the greeting to his letter in the first two verses, Peter draws continuity between the old Mosaic covenant and the new covenant in Christ's blood by applying familiar Old Testament ideas to the church today. For example, for example, in the Old Testament, the blood from a perfect animal sacrifice was used to temporarily cover the sins of the people. Today, the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus, has given his life with his blood symbolically sprinkled in a once-for-all offering that doesn't merely cover sins, but takes them away permanently. Consider these other truths. Israel had a temple. We have a temple. It's, it's our bodies. Israel had a priesthood. We have a priesthood, but ours includes and involves every single believer. In fact, before we get to today's text, look ahead a little bit. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Wonderful verses, speaking to the church, to every person who has placed their trust in Christ for salvation. He says this, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. That's us, friend. That's us, brother and sister. That's every believer today. And so we have um, a covenant, we have the sprinkling of blood, we have a temple, and we have a priesthood. These provide continuity uh, for, for the people of God in this age. But we also share in the fact of election, and that's what we're talking about here. This is the first um, truth to give us hope in hard times, to encourage us, to strengthen us, is that we have been chosen by God, this selection, the Bible calls it the, the doctrine of uh, sovereign election. You see, God chose ancient Israel for himself, and it's stated in places like Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, where it says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you, he's talking to Israel in the Old Testament, right? Has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Later in the Old Testament, he says it wasn't because you were great in number or you were better than anybody else. I chose you because I chose you. I chose you because I loved you. And so we have seen that for the Old Testament people of God, but it's true for the New Testament people of God. And we see that specifically in places like 1 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. Let's go and read them. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you, and peace be multiplied. That's, that's his greeting. It's going to be an incredible, incredible journey through this letter, by the way. But there are two facts that flow from our election. He says we are elect. And the first thing is that we are scattered. Write it down. We are scattered. We are dispersed. Because we belong to Christ, we no longer fit in the world. We don't belong. We have become, in fact, sojourners in a strange place. Pilgrims, my translation calls it. This is another parallel with Old Testament Israel. You remember, their nation was dispersed across the world due to the Assyrian and then the Babylonian captivities. Believers today have been scattered as well, but this is important. We are scattered for a different reason. Israel was scattered because of her sin. We are scattered because of our selection. Israel was scattered because of disobedience, and it, after a while God said, I, I'm going to punish you. I'm going to use these foreign nations 
to take you out of your homeland and to scatter you, to disperse you, the diaspora, um, into the nations of the world. We are foreigners because we belong to God. So we have different values than the prevailing culture. Our perspective, our priorities, our practices have all changed. Now this causes trouble with the world, I'm here to tell you. And rightly so. Because we don't belong here anymore. This world is not our home. As Paul told the Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven. So, Peter says we're different. We belong to a different world. We belong to a different place. We just live here temporarily. We reside here. But our future and our citizenship is in heaven. That's why he says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Don't be squeezed into the world's mold. This isn't you anymore. This isn't your way anymore. This isn't your place anymore. We are scattered as foreigners, strangers in a land that has become strange to us because of our salvation. So being a stranger, brother and sister, is natural. In fact, it's necessary. Look, we should want to be marginalized from what we see as normal. Look around you. Is what's happening in our country normal? Uh, and there's people telling us it is. They're saying this is the way it's always been. And we're, we're sitting there saying, that doesn't make sense, it's crazy. Well, it is crazy, folks. But it's because the world system and those who belong to it do not have a relationship with God through faith in Christ. And so this is all they have. And they're making it up as they go along. And they're following the spirit of the prince of darkness, uh, the devil. That's not us. Not anymore. So listen, folks, this is important. The world doesn't make us strangers. Election does. God's choice of us for salvation calls us out of the world system, sets us apart from the world system, and he makes us ambassadors in a world that is no longer our own. Paul actually spoke of this in 2 Corinthians when he said, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's our message. God is our, is our boss. Heaven is our home. And so he's saying that we are scattered, we are foreigners, but it's not something we should bemoan, it's something we should well, we should embrace, because that has to be the way it is. God has called us out. Now, our responsibility, because we're ambassadors, is not to withdraw from the culture, but to faithfully engage with it on God's terms. As Christian ambassadors, we retain our heavenly citizenship while we work for the one who sent us into what is now basically our host country. So although we, we respect whatever customs and practices we can down here, our allegiance is always to our home country and to the Lord God who rules it. Now Peter's audience we read here in verse 1 is scattered in, in five uh, Roman province, provinces of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, uh, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. You may have visited some of those places if you've taken a trip to the Holy Land in that area. But that's not where we live. We live here. But because of our selection, because of our election chosen by God, we, brother and sister, are also scattered wherever we live and work. So we are scattered because of election, but we are also secure because of election. And I see that in verse 2. And here we see the actual doctrine of divine election, a truth that is clearly taught in Scripture, was advocated without apology by the apostles, and was accepted by the early church. Three phrases modify our election. We've been chosen according to something, we've been chosen by something, and we've been chosen for something. So let's go ahead and look at our election. We are chosen, then the scripture says, according to the Father's foreknowledge. We see that in, 
in verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, the English dictionary describes foreknowledge as an awareness of something before it happens or exists. But the New Testament wasn't written in English. It was originally written in Koine Greek, and the definition in Greek is quite different. Foreknowledge means previously determined. It's not the idea that God just looked ahead and observed what was going to happen and made his choice based on that information. That would make man sovereign, not God. God just figured it out. We need to get this one right, folks. God doesn't discern, he decides. He just doesn't discover, he dictates what will happen in salvation, as we said earlier, before the foundation of the world, before there was an us, uh, he chose us. This same word, foreknowledge, is used earlier in the New Testament in Acts 2.23, and it's talking there about Christ being delivered to death, here's the verse, by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Now, obviously, God didn't send his son to the cross because he figured out it was going to happen. That, that's heresy. He wasn't a bystander to redemption. He made it happen. And besides, we're talking about hope here, hope in hard times. What kind of hope would we have in a God who only reacts and responds rather than a God who acts and does? If your hope is based on you chose salvation and God just looked ahead and, and saw it, then it's all depending on what you have done, not what God has done. And that's not hope. That's not confidence. That's a recipe for disaster. Besides, the Bible says that man does not seek after God. So God couldn't look ahead and see us doing something we can't do. He sought us. He drew us. He chose us. He saved us. I don't know why this doctrine causes so many problems for some Christians, but you need to get over it. It's a blessing. It's the only confidence we have. We are chosen according to the Father's foreknowledge. We are chosen by the Spirit's consecration. And that's the next part here. The Bible makes it clear that the Holy Spirit is the agent of the new birth. He's the channel. He's the one through whom it happens. The Scripture tells us the Holy Spirit is the one who stirs a desire for God in our dead hearts. He's the one who convicts us of sin and righteousness and judgment. He's the one who enables us to understand the gospel and to obey the gospel. And then he's the one who regenerates us, gives us new life when we do. So the, the, the by here, we are chosen by the Spirit's consecration. And then it says we are chosen for obedience to Christ's sprinkling, as it says here, um, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. There's this thing in Western culture where we all, we're spiritual. We have this general spirituality. I, I've talked to people who don't have a relationship with God, but they say, oh, I'm spiritual. I'm, I'm ten times spiritual. But we weren't chosen <clears throat> for some general sense of spirituality. We were chosen for a specific purpose. We were chosen for salvation, eternal salvation, through the application of the blood of Christ who has redeemed us. So we were selected, we were elected for a sprinkling and for obedience. In fact, later on in this chapter, he makes that clear. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 9, just, just look ahead in the chapter, verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. <clears throat> so you have it, friends. The first reason for hope in hard times, confidence, is that we have been selected to be a child of God. And Peter ends his greeting with his customary words, grace to you and peace be multiplied. What a great way to start the letter. So we've been selected. The second reason for Christian hope is that we are protected because we are God's child. And again, it's hopeful and it's confident because the same one who selected us is the one who protects us. 
verses 3, 4, and 5 give a, a doxology. Today we'd call it a sweeping worship song that directs our attention from the temporal to the eternal. You look around you in the temporary uh, setting right now, and you could be forgiven for having some qualms, right? We talked about some earlier. But when you see what God has for us in heaven, in the future, which is <clears throat> eternal, we recognize again, <laughs> God's got this. We're going to make it through safely. So this, uh, these verses explain the ongoing and eternal benefits of being the chosen people of God. Here's the first one. We have a living hope. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's a living hope because it comes through the living Savior, right? The Lord Jesus is mentioned four times in these first three verses, and as usual, he is intimately identified with Father God. Both the Father and the Son share the same nature because they are both God. Jesus said at one time, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he said even more clearly, I and the Father are one. And the, the, the Pharisees wanted to, you know, pick up stones and stone them for that. They knew what he was saying. So do we. The Bible makes it clear. And so we see that Jesus is identified inseparably with the Father. But here's the cool part. <laughs> because of salvation, we are identified inseparably with Jesus. God with the Father, us with Jesus. His abundant mercy, verse 3 says, has taken us from misery to majesty. He's accomplished through his, this through his resurrection from the dead. So we have been begotten, we have been born into a living hope. Now listen, don't take it from me. If you don't believe, check out any secular source you want. There is an epidemic of hopelessness in society today. And it's not just in America. It's worldwide. <clears throat> an epidemic of hopelessness, an increase in suicide. Why are people taking all these drugs and so on? Hopelessness is pandemic. It exists because there are no answers without a relationship with Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.12 says people are without hope because they are without Christ. Our hope, on the other hand, is very much alive. So, in, in dead things, you have dead hope. We have living things. We have a living hope and a living Savior and in the things he's promised for us. The second thing we have, the second benefit, is we have a lasting heritage, a living hope and a lasting heritage. And verse 4 adds this one to our understanding. So he says, see, we've been gotten again to a living hope, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. I've told you before, but I, I love the economy of God's word. When he can say in a few words, it just blows my mind and, and, and just flips all my theological switches. What a blessing. What wonderful things. We're going to look at just briefly what each of these things means, but I want you to see that we have a heritage, an inheritance. As I've said earlier, a sin-defaced physical life produces a defective inheritance, things that we will leave behind us when we die. But our spiritual inheritance is glorious. It's tax-free, and it's not subject to the whims of the stock market. So look how Peter describes it here. He says here, inheritance, first of all, is incorruptible, which is uh, imperishable. It can't be destroyed. It can't be killed off. It is undefiled, which means it's not stained or polluted. It is flawlessly perfect, always. It will never fade away. And the word here in, in the secular Greek was uh, a flower um, in its prime. It had its, its beauty. And he says that our inheritance will never wither like a dying flower. That's, that's the idea. And then he says it's reserved in heaven for us. I love that one. Uh, there's no, nobody puts out a reserved parking spot for, for Doug Carlson. So um, I usually park farther away, which is good for me anyway to get the exercise. So, you know, no one knows about me and nobody has a reserve for I'm not anybody important and that's fine. But there is a place in heaven with my name on it, reserved for me. And again, not because I'm somebody special, but because of who I belong to. And that's true for you too. If you're a child of God, if you're a Christian today, heaven 
is reserved for you. Better than a parking spot, all the glories of paradise has your name on it because you have Jesus' name on you. That's, that's wonderful, encouraging truth right there. And it is kept, the inheritance is kept in the most secure place in the universe, in a place where Jesus said, neither moth nor rust destroys, and thieves don't break in and steal. And so we have these marvelous things. We are protected because God has chosen us to be his child. We have a living hope. We have a lasting heritage, and we are protected heirs. And I think this is interesting in verse 5, where we see that not only is our inheritance secure, but we are as well. The spiritual inheritors, us, we, are kept by the very power of God. Look at verse 5. Who, now I need to go back a little bit to verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So we are preserved. It's not just that the inheritance is secure. We're secure. We are preserved through life and throughout eternity and guaranteed that we will receive the salvation, the deliverance, ready to be revealed in the last time. This will occur when God ushers us into glory at last. And though we as heirs may be in peril here, we will be protected and we will be received in heaven. Because God never promised us an easy journey, but he has promised us a safe arrival. I'm depending on it, brother, sister. You can as well. Because the clear testament the testimony of the Word of God is that we have eternal security. If it was based on my choice, nah, wouldn't happen. If it was based on my faithfulness after I came to Christ, uh, it's not going to happen. But it's based on Christ. And though we fail Him, He never fails us. Though we are faithless, He is faithful. So no matter what hardship you're going through right now, my listening friend, you can have confidence in both the divine selection and the divine protection offered you through Christ. But that's only if you're trusting in Him. If you're a child of God, don't give up. Don't give in to insecurity and worry and fear. And don't stop sharing your faith so that those hopeless people around you can experience what God has given to you. They're hopeless because they're Christless and you have Jesus. Don't just keep that faith. Give it away. Share him today. And let's have more people filled with the confidence of a child of God. It's good to be back with you. Have a great week. And we'll see you again next time, Lord willing.